we're back. Hope you had a nice break. Uh, this is Nellie Deutsch. There's our presenter getting ready. This is Moodle Moot Virtual Conference. It's the fourth of its kind. It started, well, it was supposed to start in Cancun, Mexico, so that's where the uh, photo comes from, but it uh, became a virtual conference. It started in 2011, and we are ready for our next presentation. Uh, for those of you that would like to see the presenters, we um, we have two new additions to the list, and you've already heard, or if you haven't, you should listen to the recording uh, right here, uh, Rachel Sale, and then we've got later on at the end of the day, we have uh, something really exciting that you are definitely going to be excited about, and it concerns concerns how we can get fast information in real time from our LMS. So a little bit about Vicky, I can tell you uh, from knowing Vicky online, we've never met face to face. I'm sure we will very soon, uh, probably in April at the um, conference in ITEFL. I don't know if you're going, but I hope you are. And I hope I am too. <laughs> so we'll get a chance to, uh, to meet. Uh, Vicky is a very passionate learner, and she's very serious about everything she does. Um, she cares, and that's what I got just from um, watching her online. <laughs> that's my observation. <laughs> she's a foreign language teacher, and notice the languages here. You can only wish for these languages, English, Italian, and Greek. What a wonderful combination. She's had 20 years experience, uh, mainly with adults. She has an MA from the University of Cyprus, and an MA from Goldsmith, which is a great university, by the way, in uh, the UK. Uh, she um, travels <laughs> a lot. You can she, yeah. <laughs> She's been at the McLuhan, uh, Marshall McLuhan's program in culture and technology mm -hmm. at the University of Toronto, where she uh, participated in an international project in translation. Uh, she writes articles and blogs, and, and <laughs> she's amazing. I mean, every student would love to learn with Vicky. So I think online is the best bet, since that's the only way we can connect and not travel to Greece, where you are currently living. Uh, she's going to be talking about MOOCs. She's interested in the MOOCs and the way they're developing. Um, and I think that's it. She's a lecturer, a junk lecturer at MAC mm -hmm. College. Maybe you can tell us where that is. It sounds like it's online. Is it face to face? Oh, yeah, it's face. No, no, it's face to face. Face it's to face. Here in Thessaloniki. Oh, great. So um, it gives me great pleasure to pass on the rest of the conversation here. Uh, where is your? Um, oh, there it is. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. If you could just add in the chat box where you're from. People will be coming in as we go, so you can welcome them. Thank you. Thank you so much for everything. Hi, Rosemary. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Nelly was kind enough to introduce me. Um, I'm not going to tell you a lot of things about me. I think uh, here is Nelly. No, it's not Nelly. actually. No, no, it's face to face. Uh, it's here in Thessaloniki. Uh, Nelly, I also speak uh, Hungarian, so <laughs> I can speak <scoop> you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No way! Nelly, Are you thank serious? You uh, you why, how oh, got interested in thank you. Um, MOOCs. Ah, okay, I was trying. Uh, I started uh, attending MOOCs. Uh, Wow, uh, a lot of years uh, ago, like four or five years ago. Thank you so much um, for everything. Uh, Hi, Rosemary. Okay, Nelly was kind enough to introduce me. How um, I'm not going to tell you a lot of things Last about year, me. I think uh, uh, here, as Nelly said, more than enough. Uh, and by the way, uh, Nelly, I also speak uh, Hungarian, so <laughs> I can spook you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to start by telling you how I, how I got interested in uh, MOOCs. 
Uh, I started uh, attending MOOCs, uh, uh, wow, well, uh, a lot of years uh, ago, like four or five years ago. And um, I started, uh, you know, being very, very interested in them. As I could see, a lot of things uh, evolving. And um, I started watching how they developed and how they changed over the time. Now, last year, I did a PGC uh, in uh, Technology Enhanced Learning. I am um, very much into uh, learning, so every year I try to find new things. And uh, anyway, last year we started talking, basically, uh, about uh, MOOCs, and uh, I blogged a little bit about them, and uh, I did some more MOOCs uh, as well on the way. So. Uh, this is how this presentation basically uh, came about. Also, an opportunity for massification, of course. Steve. So, sometimes we can see. Okay, uh, let's see. The first early examples of MOOCs date uh, only just a few years back, making them a quite recent online learning phenomenon, which has generated a lot of attention from people, media. Uh, from uh, higher education institutions. So on one hand, uh, they're considered an extension of existing online learning approaches. And on the other hand, they're also seen uh, as an opportunity for a new business model in education. So let us just consider some key characteristics of these courses to begin with. They offer an opportunity for massification of courses. Sometimes we can see incredible numbers of participants, like 20,000, 30, 40, 50,000. Um, this is really, you know, uh, it blows you away, you know, the, the, the number of people that uh, you can have there. Uh, so, uh, undoubtedly, this has generated a lot of interest from governments, institutions, commercial organizations, resulting in the creation of a number of MOOC platforms, which have been developed and offer courses independent of or in collaboration with universities. And the motivations for learners to participate are varied. So, MOOCs uh, promise free access courses, uh, which might cut down in the end the cost of university level education. We'll see about that. And least universities put their courses online and set up uh, open learning platforms. Platforms like Coursera, Udacity, they have launched collaboration on the other hand with prestigious universities. And um, generally MOOCs have become so popular that uh, this has led people to reconsider online learning as strategic choice for future. So let me just uh, give you some numbers and I want you to try and uh, guess what uh, they stand for. Let me tell you, in 2014, the number of universities... 400 plus, 2400 plus, 16 to 18 million. Uh, do you have some Is guesses? What do you think they stand for? You drop your mouse, Nelly, or Hungarian? Yes, I'll tell you about it another time. Uh, 400 plus MOOCs yearly. Mm, okay, you're not close, <laughs> Rosemary. Last number of online students. Which one, Mary? 400? Uh, the last is the number of online students. You're correct about that. What about the other two? So, uh, right, well, uh, okay. how did they let start? me tell you, uh, how did they go in 2014, uh, the number of universities uh, offering uh, MOOCs uh, has doubled to cross 400 universities. The term, a massive this resulted in a doubling of the number of cumulative courses to 2,400. 22 of the top 25 U.S. universities in U.S. News World Report rankings are now offering courses online for free. So far, 16 to 18 million students in just a few years. We can imagine then how important they have start, uh, started becoming. So, uh, okay, how did they start? Uh, how did they get the name? 
in scale uh, of following on from uh, the development of uh, open education resources and the open education movement the term massive open online courses was first introduced in 2008 by Dave Cormier uh, to describe Siemens and Don's connectivism and connective uh, knowledge goals. Now, the original aim of MOOCs was to open up education and provide free access to university level education for as many students as possible. So, in contrast to traditional university online courses, MOOCs have two key features. Open access, so anyone can participate in an online course for free. In scalability, courses are designed to support an indefinite number of uh, participants. Now, however, however, these uh, features may be interpreted uh, differently by different MOOC providers. So some MOOCs are massive, but not open, and some are open, but not massive. Uh, Wiley, in 2012, pointed out that the ambiguities in the concept of MOOCs may pose a threat to the future development of uh, open uh, educational resources and open courses where the general public will receive free, that free is good enough, and no one will care about open. But uh, these questions uh, are left alone. Then. We have to realize that the development of MOOCs is rooted within the ideals of openness in education, that knowledge should be shared freely, and the desire to learn should be met without demographic, economic, and geographical constraints. So, if we look at the diagram, we can see that now, since 2000, the concept of openness in education has been evolving rapidly. A key message that emerges is that the evolution of MOOCs is leading to more players in the market. So who are these players? Who are the major uh, MOOC providers? Now, in 2013, Coursera offered nearly half of all MOOCs. In 2014, though, its share has shrunk to a third. It's still the largest, twice as large as edX, which doubled its share in the last year. In 2004, there were no major providers launched. Now, if we have a closer look at the most popular uh, platforms, just give me a second. Okay, so uh, edX uh, is a non-profit MOOC platform. Uh, it was first founded by MIT and Harvard, uh, the courses that they offer will not be offered, uh, I mean, the MIT and Harvard courses will not be offered for credit at either university, but online learners uh, who demonstrate mastery of uh, subjects can pay a fee for a certificate of completion, as do most of uh, these platforms, not all of them, but most of them. Concera, which seems to be the biggest, uh, the, the major player here, uh, now has uh, 107 partners, 532 courses, and over 5.2 million students. Imagine what kind of numbers we're talking about. Some partner universities here offer credit for their Coursera classes. I'm going to talk uh, about them uh, a bit later. To those who want to pay a fee to have some extra assignments, work with an instructor, be assessed. Udapt is another uh, interesting platform. Uh, it's a for profit platform, initially founded by Sebastian Sran. Now, uh, when students, uh, they, they specialize in computer science, mathematics, uh, general sciences, programming. Uh, to when students complete a course, they can receive a certificate of uh, completion. Now, Udemy uh, was founded in 2010, and um, uh, it's a platform again that allows anyone to teach and participate in online video classes. An interesting platform is uh, P2PU that was launched in 2009, and made, mainly funded by the Hewlett Foundation and the Shuttleworth Foundation. Now, it offers uh, some of the features of MOOCs, 
that it's focused on the community-centered approach to provide uh, opportunities for anyone that is willing to teach and learn online. There are over 50 courses available. The process of improving the quality of the courses relies on community review, feedback and revision. So that's quite interesting. And uh, there are no fees or credits uh, there. And what they did, uh, I think since last year, is that they adopted the badge reward system to integrate uh, elements of gamification into the learning progress, process. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to finish with Khan Academy, very, very well known. Uh, it's a not-for-profit educational organization. Uh, behind it is the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation and Google. Uh, it started in uh, 2008 and it offers over 3,600 video lectures in academic subjects. Automatic exercises, continuous assessments, uh, this is the profile that uh, they have. Now, uh, you uh, uh, all you can imagine. Oh, before I go there, I've also included uh, in my slides for anyone that might be interested um, a slide with the three major uh, platforms and some pros and cons. I'm not going to go through them, of course, but perhaps someone is interested to have a look. Um, now, uh, we can imagine, of course, why uh, these MOOCs uh, can be so popular. Okay, the basic thing that you need is a reliable internet connection, some free time to dedicate, so uh, it seems uh, convenient. Uh, the majority of them are free. Uh, you might have to pay, as I already mentioned, uh, if you want a verified certificate, uh, then uh, perhaps you have to pay a small amount of money. It could vary from 20, 40, 50 um, dollars. Uh, in just a few cases, it might be about 200 dollars. Uh, or if we're talking about a kind of a series of uh, courses, uh, now, then it might, the uh, you know, mount up to something like that. Anyway, thousands of courses from literally all over the world available, huge variety of uh, subjects. Um, we can take a pick. There are only a few, perhaps, fields that uh, MOOCs do not cover. Um, no real requirements, and that's uh, one of the basic differences with formal education. Nobody uh, is going to ask you for, uh, for example, uh, for a degree, uh, a BA or something. So you can just attend whatever you feel like, as long as you're interested in it. Um, now, a lot of universities that uh, organize MOOCs are trying to make them count as credit towards a higher education award. Coursera has started doing that, some of the universities. Um, another reason why they're so popular is because uh, there might be a future economic benefit. Why? Because these uh, MOOCs uh, certificates, basically, and all the training that you might do, uh, it uh, can easily count as a continuous of professional development. And uh, to tell you the truth, a lot of employers currently, uh, they feel a bit interested in what you do, even you know at this level with MOOCs. Now, of course, there are people that do it uh, out of enjoyment and fun. They have free time. And uh, why not spend this free time on um, uh, sorry, uh, on attending uh, book rather than doing I something really. else. And uh, one last category, of uh, course, is uh, the yeah, people I that know, just I want to experience, right? explore it's online education. Now. They're not very familiar uh, with it. And uh, I think they realize soon that, uh, they know that you it's not that difficult to navigate yeah, and uh, to use it. And they kind of enjoy it a lot. They know that, uh, you get there is also a... A dark side on it. Before I go to the dark so side, uh, I can see. Uh, sorry, I was a bit, you know, focusing on what I was saying. So I have to say hi to everybody. Uh, hi, Theodora. So many thank you for coming here. Uh, so glad to see you here. Hi, everybody. 
Uh, yeah, I know, I know, Rosemary, you're right. Certificates count. And uh, people, uh, employers are interested in it because they know that you dedicate time. Uh, it might not be formal education, but they know that uh, you dedicate time. So uh, that's why they, they count. And uh, I think that you do learn. And, uh, All right, so as I was saying, there is kind of a dark sign. So there are the skepticists. Uh, so the skepticists claim that it's a delusion to believe that the masses can be educated in this way. Well, I think mainly this is because of lack of research about how students learn in massive open online uh, platforms. And also because we have such huge enrollment numbers that uh, they make them hard to teach. And there is another thing that I want us to discuss a little bit. Uh, there are high dropout rates. This is true, okay. But at this point, I would like to ask you if uh, you have ever signed up for a MOOC and uh, dropped out or never actually attended. Instead of putting them on a calendar that it would be too confusing for me, I just uh, signed up. And yes, yes both twice, of both of them. Right. Some of them are hard to follow. Yes. But have you dropped and, uh, out or have you just uh, completed it? I've never done this, but I've I've read. Oh, you dropped it. out. Okay. Uh, All right. So yes, anybody yes, else who uh, dropped out? Completely. Never completed the current. Yeah. See. Uh, you can. Yeah. More about that. Don't worry. I'm I agree. Overwhelmed, dropped out. Well, I can give you various reasons. I've done the so, same thing. Uh, as I, was saying, uh, I, I always I uh, sign up for MOOCs. Out, uh, and uh, to tell you the truth, the main reason is that uh, it's a kind of bookmarking I, for me. I Instead of putting them on a calendar, that it would be too confusing for me, I just uh, and, sign up. Uh, that's how and it, yes, it was it was it was it was some of them are hard to follow, yes. Uh, oh, the connectivism really? MOOCs. Okay. I've never done this, but I've, I've read about them, uh, uh, Nelly. Uh, so if you uh, probably, I really like them. you know, you have a lot of experience with them, and I know that, uh, uh, you can tell me more about them, because I've never attended one. Uh, really yeah. Okay. All right, so, so uh, as I was saying, uh, anyway, I signed okay, up for several uh, ones. I drop uh, out uh, out of most of them. I have completed now, some of them. I I follow some until a point and that I'm in it, and then uh, that's it. And uh, that's how uh, it works. You find that X MOOCs are uh, really boring. Really? Okay. I think it depends. Uh, uh, Eva, because I've um, I've experienced several Xbooks and I really like them. Okay. But I know that uh, a lot of uh, people and a lot of uh, literature says that people read it. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, okay, let's uh, you know talk about some numbers uh, now. It's a contested debate whether the dropout rates and progression should be a concern for MOOCs. Now, Mayer in 2012 reported that the dropout rates of MOOCs offered by Stanford, MIT, Berkeley were 80 to 95 percent. For example, only 7 percent of the 50,000 students who took the Coursera Berkeley course in software engineering actually completed it. Yes, now, there are similar reported uh, dropout rates uh, in a lot of uh, sources, but what I wanted to say is that uh, whether or not these rates matter depends largely on the perceived purpose of the MOOCs in the first uh, place. So, if the aim is to give the opportunity of access to free and high courses from elite universities and elite professors, then high dropout rates Perhaps, you know, uh, are not the primary concern. Yes. I don't know. What do you think? Do you think that dropout rates really, really matter that much? Yes, we shouldn't be concerned that much because we're talking about mass, 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 uh, you know, uh, attendances. And yes, I agree that sometimes, you know, the traditional uh, using technology, not always, though. 
profiles is not a quality concern. Yeah, I agree too. I wouldn't care that much. I had well, I've had so far different experiences. Yeah, see, both just. Sometimes yeah, I think confused. most of us agree yeah, that uh, it doesn't matter because course, we have the opportunity of attending these things. courses. And I really yes, uh, boredom should uh, be a concern. Yes, this is what I was going to say, that on one hand, yes, we shouldn't be concerned that much because we're talking about mass, 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 uh, you know, uh, attendances. And we do have to agree that uh, it, it would be useful to improve the retention uh, rates of MOOCs. Boredom is a problem. Sometimes very long courses is a problem. And uh, I, I had, uh, I've had so far different experiences uh, with MOOCs. Sometimes it was even confusion. I mean, I tried attending that was uh, over a year and a half, of course, that it sounded so promising. And I really was looking forward to uh, not just completing it, but to just attending it. And then they were doing it from a very good university. They were doing it for the first time. And at some point, the dates and the um, deadlines, they were confused. They changed them repeatedly. I had to go. Education in right. A, a much okay, so way. And I think um, it's if I go on with uh, the skepticism, uh, communities. Uh, now another claim that they make is that now, MOOCs are supposed to be reaching poor the, and uneducated the, people. The ones taking MOOCs uh, do not actually fall in this category. This might be true, but I think that. Uh, Probably and it's going to change because if we're talking about uh, developing countries, uh, there still must be several problems. But uh, I think that uh, already they are looking more forward into using MOOCs because uh, they can find in this way um, education in uh, a much cheaper way. And I think that uh, eventually it will reach the the poor uh, communities as well. Now, there is also a risk that uh, the current enthusiasm is being driven basically by what? Um, a community of highly educated, IT literate individuals. Um, a lot of people who are not, um, who have less IT knowledge, uh, perhaps do not attend so much courses like that. And they find them intimidating. But I think that even this argument uh, does not count that much because uh, people are um, are getting connected. And they they get to know that uh, basically these kind of books are not that difficult to navigate and uh, to work on. And I think that uh, this is not going to be the case in a couple of years. Now, what I'm most interested about are the concerns, though, about the pedagogy and quality of current MOOC courses. And to be more specific, uh, the skepticists believe that compared to other online courses, MOOCs lack structure. They rarely include the central role of the instructor or teacher. They are largely self-directed learning, which is a very different experience to formal education. Uh, do you believe that uh, this is true? Really? Yes, but I agree you, that uh, distance courses, online yeah, distance uh, courses, yeah, okay. are amazing, um, and they're becoming even more amazing. Says, uh, I've never attended the. Uh, and they're uh, far uh, more, um, uh, but, you know, organized uh, and uh, thought of. Literature, whatever I've read so far, they say that uh, they were a bit mm -hmm. confusing. They were it's not the instructors, not the great videos, uh, videos. Uh, I'm going to talk later on about. Uh, about this, you're very uh, right about that, this. I totally uh, agree. I don't know if uh, they it needed to be mm. very. Uh, you think that that's a goal? Choosing is good for learning. Yes, but it's good for learning. For really? People that uh, you know they are IT literate and uh, people. But isn't it? Uh, uh, really yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, as I said, uh, I've never attended the, uh, you know, CMOOCs. Uh, but um, 
from the literature, whatever I've read so far, they say that uh, they were a bit confusing. They were more fun. They were more open in a lot of ways, community building and everything, networking and uh, all that. Uh, but um, I don't know if uh, they, they needed to be very um, Confusing is good for learning. Yes, but it's good for learning for people that, uh, you know, they are IT literate and uh, people that, uh, you know, they really more or less know where they're going. Other than that, think about someone who is just trying to find their way uh, in there and perhaps, I don't know, it's not very good for them. Again, about the pedagogy. I mean, uh, about CIMOX, um, I know that, that they provide great opportunities and uh, online communities, they crowdsourced answers to problems, they created networks and all that. Yeah, I know. Well, um, the thing is that uh, okay. Some of, uh, I I do have to tell you though that uh, I have attended uh, Nelly several MOOCs that uh, seem uh, very uh, interesting one, very well paced, very organized, and I find enjoyed them. Uh, have to tell you. And other ones, as I said, not uh, that much. Um, okay. Um. Anyway. Um. Talking again about the pedagogy and that, uh, there are two more problems there, assessment and uh, credit. Uh, I mean, most MOOCs use quizzes uh, as the main instrument of assessment, multiple choice questions, automated answers, etc., etc. Um, the thing is that uh, some of, uh, you know, the MOOCs uh, also use, uh, they require open responses. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, it's difficult, it's not possible uh, for thousands of essay assignments to be marked by just uh, one um, lecture or two or three or four. Okay, so that's why uh, MOOCs rely heavily on peer engagement and assessment to support the individual student's learning process. So Coursera uh, rely heavily on peer engagement uh, and uh, they include submission of essay style answers graded through peer assessment and they try to scale uh, and to balance the scale between um, sorry, the scale with the available so, uh, resource. Now, some concerns are expressed around cheating and plagiarism, of course, with online learning. But, um, I mean, uh, if academic credits uh, do not count in most of them, then I, I don't think that this is a huge problem. Quality assurance is, assurance is another problem because um, there is little formal quality assurance. It's been suggested that one approach uh, could be for them to be evaluated by learners and educators, educators leading to league tables that um, can rank the courses by the quality of uh, the offering. So in this way, it's possible that courses from institutions and individuals that rate poorly, they might disappear due to lack of demand or will survive by improving course quality in response to poor ratings. Now, um, no matter what uh, both sides uh, uh, say, uh, I think we all have to admit uh, one thing, that uh, uh, basically what is true is that the current trend in uh, higher education leads toward a future of openness in higher education, open curriculum, open learning, open assessment, uh, open uh, platform. All right. So, uh, before I go on, can I ask you, what do you think? What is your opinion? Do you think that MOOCs are finally a revolution or a failure? Thank you, Nelly. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you, you like them. Mm -hmm. yes. Time will tell. Yes, that's what I'm saying. I see you're writing, I see you're typing. So. I agree that time will tell. Uh, I believe that, uh, you know, uh, there's something uh, different and uh, something that uh, can give a lot of uh, opportunities. But, um, of course, it's too early for anybody to say. 
Uh, Revolution, definitely. Uh, let's see. I mean, sorry about that. I have to leave it here for a minute. Um, we have to mm -hmm. perhaps not an easy answer uh, on something that MOOCs mm -hmm. um, are influencing not just campus life, yes, but uh, also time will tell. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Space. Um, ideas about what we offer. I agree that time will tell. Uh, I believe that uh, you know. Uh, there's something uh, different and uh, something that uh, can give a lot of uh, opportunities. But um, of course, it's too early for anybody to say. There are a lot of parts in you know in this game. A lot of different. Let's see. I mean, sorry about that. I have to leave it here for a minute. Um, we have to perhaps agree uh, on something that MOOCs um, are influencing not just campus life, but uh, also the broader education and research space. Um, Ideas about what they offer, whom they might uh, help or evolving uh, as rapidly as the MOOCs themselves. And uh, actually, I think that one reason why we cannot really tell what uh, the future will bring is because MOOCs are evolving very, very rapidly. And uh, there are a lot of uh, parts in, uh, you know, in this game, a lot of different parties. So um, a lot of money that uh, they can make eventually. So we'll see what they're going to bring. Now about uh, uh, you know the fact uh, that we talked earlier about the dropout rates, and I can tell you that uh, some uh, other people see it as a kind of victory because uh, if uh, we have to you know stuck in. Uh, uh, 12 week syllabus, for example, where we paid for and we cannot get out of it even if uh, we find it uh, very boring. And then we have MOOCs where uh, we enroll and uh, we try the first two, three weeks and we realize we don't care or we don't care about everything. So, what possibilities do we have? We can drop out and we don't feel the boredom anymore. Or we can take some of the material that we're really interested in. So, it, it could be a kind of a victory in certain cases. Um, educational institutions are very much interested. I can tell you that even in Greece, major universities have started uh, organizing MOOCs uh, over a year ago. And uh, they're getting into the game. So, even smaller countries are getting into to to this game. Uh, now, MOOCs can claim a special status at the moment also in innovating pedagogy. Why? Because they bring together other innovations like badges, mobile learning, learning analytics. Uh, the two uh, burning issues so remain though um, the exploration of a viable business model and the accreditation of book learning. Uh, in my opinion, these two factors are going to shape actually the future of uh, MOOCs. I don't know if uh, you agree uh, with me, perhaps not, but this is uh, how I see it. But uh, anyway, people are interested in MOOCs, uh, that much uh, we can tell. So, if we have to choose the right MOOC, basically, how do we, how can we do that? Well, um, the course length is one of the factors, and uh, the instructors, we can find a short biography of them, uh, the university or the institution that uh, has organized them, uh, the course syllabus, uh, most of the times uh, is there, um, the course format uh, as well, even if it's not there when it's being asked, we can find them immediately after the course uh, But the previous uh, facts, the four, uh, the first four uh, so you have factors are there for the kinds. Now the course schedule is a thing that we need to consider because there may be a few courses that allow you to join the course anytime that you want to. 
and then there may be others that need you to follow the university semester program. So you have to decide uh, between the two types if you want a self-paced MOOC or a scheduled uh, MOOC. Um, you, you have to determine the amount of time that you have to devote uh, to a course. So while courses uh, allow you to uh, generally work at your own pace, they still have requirements that have to be met in order to successfully complete the course. So you have to think about what kind of prior engagements you have and determine how much time you will have to spend on a course each week. Most of the times uh, you can find um, a kind of an estimate basically that uh, the course providers give. They will tell you that perhaps you need three or four hours that you need to engage with the course. Um, most courses uh, give you that. Um, a, a portfolio uh, can go with a portfolio that lets you increase your chances of getting hired in the future. Uh, it allows you to create a project in the end that showcases uh, what you learn to your prospective employer. Um, Nelly, you talked about uh, videos uh, before, before, and I couldn't agree more. Um, we cannot, one thing we should not do is judge a course by the videos because some online courses, um, they come with uh, these highly produced videos, graphics, etc., etc., and some others, you just have a professor in front of a camera. And sometimes the truth is that the ones with uh, very, very, you know, uh, uh, the great uh, videos are not that, um, they end up being more monotonous actually, or there is no real them. And you might find uh, out that uh, the ones with uh, just a professor uh, might be more interesting because commitment is not knowledge, his personality, are things that, uh, uh, you know, they're going to uh, attract you and uh, perhaps even enchant you. One last thing that you shouldn't expect is yeah, consistency. Because, yeah. as I mentioned earlier, and I, I think that most of us uh, know it, there are so many universities behind it and then so many different departments of these universities behind them. Uh, that organize these uh, courses. That yes, you have the platforms like Coursera, edX, etc., etc. But uh, the the content, the curriculum, uh, the class requirements, all these are set by the professor, the schools, the institutions behind them. The attention that have started receiving is. Um, let me see what you're saying about the videos. consider is um, that uh, yeah. teachers are already yeah. about the audience. Sometimes I agree a with study you. of 11 really. books uh, offered by MIT uh, found that uh, okay. 28% Little bit before I finish, I have to finish two uh, more so, numbers uh, that I would like to give you. I, think uh, I want really to bring to your attention that uh, today there are nearly 600 publications that and, uh, reference MOOCs. Uh, and this counts from the source of 2015. So you can imagine that uh, the attention that uh, MOOCs have started receiving is already quite, uh, you know, big. And another fact that I want you to uh, consider is um, that uh, teachers are already a big audience. A study of 11 MOOCs uh, offered by MIT uh, found that uh, nearly 28% of enrollees were former or active teachers. If you are determined, so uh, nobody can stop you. But if you're not, I think that teachers really, really love MOOCs. I know several of them that uh, uh, you know attempt them, and they really like them. Teachers love to learn. That's why they teach. And Teachers love to learn, that's why they attend MOOCs. <laughs> sometimes people do not know, I think, uh, where to find these uh, resources. All right, I'm going to finish uh, with uh, one thing that uh, basically, uh, even about the skepticism uh, generally of uh, the different types of uh, MOOCs, I know one thing that uh, 
if you are determined to learn, uh, nobody can stop you. <laughs> but if you're not willing Perhaps to learn, uh, <laughs> no one uh, can help you. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed or you found uh, you know interesting the presentation. Why learn very uh, Because sometimes people do not know, I think, uh, where to find these uh, resources. And uh, this is why 